Good to see everybody uh, tonight. Uh, just a few announcements we wanted to make. You know, we're, we're still caught up in this coronavirus crisis, uh, uh, but we're, we're going to get through this, and hopefully uh, pretty soon, you know, we'll, we'll be able to meet again and, and, and like we normally do. Uh, just a, a few announcements. It's, it's good that Matt and Crystal and, and their children are going to be able to stay with us another couple of months, and that's that's a happy note there. Uh, uh, I'll ask, too, that, that those who have the World Bible School courses out, if you would, try to turn those back in as soon as possible, and we're going to try and get those mailed out. Uh, we've, we've had them a little while and, and probably need to get them back uh, so, so they can do those courses. <clears throat> also, uh, uh, Sister Galloway had hurt her back, so let's keep her in her prayers along with the others in a, on her prayer list. And hopefully everybody's picked up a bulletin or uh, had a bulletin mailed to them and they're able to, to get those. <clears throat> just uh, I just wanted to say one other little thing here. You know, the Bible tells us in, in Proverbs that, uh, that a merry heart is good for the soul. Uh, you know, we say, too, that, that, that laughter is, and it probably came from the Bible, but laughter is good medicine. So uh, I was at East Point here a while back, and they had a gospel meeting, and, and the preacher was telling about in the, in the youth class, they, uh, the teacher told them, said, look, uh, I want y'all to, uh, for next Sunday, she gave them an assignment. For next Sunday, she said, I want you to think about something that represents Christianity and, and bring it uh, for next Sunday. Well, the next Sunday came along. Well, uh, one of them, Johnny, we'll call him Johnny, he, he thought all week about something, and he finally got this good idea. But anyway, the next Sunday, they, they came together, and one little girl, she, she had a, uh, brought a flashlight, and, and she said, well, look, uh, we're the light of the world. Christians are a light of the world. And so the teacher said, that's good. And, and so the next uh, little girl, our boy, uh, brought a, a shaker of salt. And he kind of shook it out there and, you know, on the table and said, said we're the, uh, you're the salt of the earth. And so little Johnny, he, he had had this good idea and thought about it all week. So, so he comes and he has an egg. And uh, his teacher was a little... Uh, wondering about it a little bit. But anyway, Johnny, he sa she says, what have you got there, Johnny? And he says, well, I got an egg. So he took the egg and, and he cracked it on the table. And he told her, he said, hold out your hand. So he cracked that egg and, on the table there. And, and, and she held out her hands and he cracked that joke. And, and he just all over her hands. Opened it up. It was all over her hands. Yoke running everywhere. And he said, and then he, he said, he said, well, you're the yoke. Let my yoke be upon you. So anyway, maybe laughter may be, uh, you know, in these trying times, maybe a little laughter will be some good medicine for us. Uh, uh, Y'all have a good day and, and looking forward to Jason's lesson. Uh, keep in touch and, and let's continue to pray about things and keep one another in our thoughts. Have a good evening. I think the yoke is among us here. <laughs> let's go to God in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before thee, heads bowed just as humbly as we know how to approach thy throne of grace and mercy. We come, Father, as children of thine, seeking thy blessing, seeking thy approval, most of all seeking to do the things that you have commanded us to do. As we journey through this uneven world, Father, we're in a pit right now with this pandemic that's among us. We but we know, God, that you are constant, you are steadfast, you are always there. This too shall pass, but you will always be there. And we pray, God, that we'll keep that first and foremost in our mind, that no matter what happens in this world, if we're faithful to thee and thy word, we can have that home in heaven with thee. Father, we pray earnestly for those who have, have fallen victim to this virus we pray god that you'll be with those that are sick and in the hospital and still fighting those yet to have the virus we pray earnestly for the families of those who have lost loved ones because of the virus and we pray god that you'll uh, help comfort them we thank you god for all you do for us you bless us beyond anything we can even imagine and we pray that we'll 
always keep this in mind. We're especially blessed with thy son Jesus, thy only begotten son that you sent to this world. He lived that perfect life before us and he made that perfect sacrifice that we could not do. He paid a price because of our sins that we could never pay. We thank you, God, for his willingness to do that, and we remember him each and every day, Father, especially uh, on a Sunday morning when we come together to observe the Lord's Supper. We pray, God, that we always do that in a way that would be pleasing to you. Some of our number, Father, here at the church family that's, that's sick, we know Sheila just underwent a, uh, a spine, spinal uh, operation and uh, we pray God that uh, it will do her good we have many others that have been ill and uh, not with the virus but other causes and we pray God that you'll be with each and every one of them we pray God that this pandemic soon be over we long to come together as a church to worship thee to uh, see each other to be renewed by those that are around us that have this same uh, faith as we do and we pray God that that may soon come to pass. We pray for all of our government, Father. We know that uh, the governmental powers are instituted by you and they are instituted for our benefit. And we pray, God, that we will follow the advice of, of our leaders in that regard. We pray that uh, we'll do the things that common sense would tell us to do so that we might not fall victim to this uh, pandemic. We pray especially for our brethren in Africa we know that uh, many of them there that we've met, we've become friends with, they don't have the facilities there to deal with this uh, pandemic, but it is in Africa and the places that we've been. And we earnestly pray, Father, that you'll help those good people to stay separated from each other, that it might not spread like it has in other places. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you for sending Jason uh, uh, our way uh, we've really enjoyed having him as a preacher and we pray God that he will continue to grow in the, the faith and his ability to pre present thy truths we thank you for Jason Thompson father that has uh, made it possible for us to speak to the congregation and, and all of us be a part through this uh, YouTube uh, video we thank you God for that and we pray that uh, even though we can't be together physically, we can be, be together spiritually as we watch this. Thank you so much, Father, for all you do for us. Forgive us of our sins. We know what we say and do things that we shouldn't, and we don't do things that we should, but we pray, Father, that we'll strive to walk in the light, and we know that the Son, the blood of thy blessed Son, Jesus, will cleanse us from all iniquities and we pray God that we might seek thee in everything we do these blessings and favor we ask in Jesus holy name amen good evening hope everyone is doing uh, well tonight of course we continue to uh, pray for everyone and hopefully again uh, maybe before too long we'll be able to be back together physically uh, but so thankful for everyone uh, tuning in tonight uh, one thing I need to mention is in the next couple of weeks, I'm planning on doing um, the answering of some of the questions uh, that we've got in our question box here at the building. So if you have a question that you would like ans answered about the Bible, uh, then please take that and you can bring it by if you come by to drop off your contribution or something like that and drop it in the box. Or you can text it to me, uh, but I am planning to do that in the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, so if you do have those, please get them to me uh, so I can get you a proper answer uh, for those. But tonight we are on page 47. Uh, remember we've looked at, uh, we're starting to look at languages. We looked at um, Aramaic and Latin last time about how those are minor languages. They're not used very much in the Bible, but they are still important uh, for us and being able to confirm that indeed our Bibles are from God um, and things of that nature. So tonight, though, we're going to look at the major languages. So we've looked at Aramaic, we've looked at Latin, and now we're going to look at the two major, the two languages that make up most uh, of our Bibles. And so the first one we're going to look at is Hebrew. 
And as we think about the Hebrew language, uh, this is the language, of course, that makes up the bulk of the Old Testament. Old Testament has some Aramaic. We looked in Ezra, Daniel, Genesis, a couple other places that has Aramaic. Uh, but most of your Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And there are some reasons why Hebrew was the chosen language for the Old Testament and why a different language was used uh, for the New Testament. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. But the Old Testament, one reason why Hebrew is the language that was used for this is that it is mainly a biography. Okay? The Old Testament is mostly a biography of God's people and also God's dealing with those people. You think about Genesis, you've got a biography of a lot of different folks there like Noah, you've got Abraham, you've got Joseph, okay? and then you go into Exodus and uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you've got Moses and the Israelites and their story. You go through the judges, it's different biographies of the judges. Joshua is about Joshua and his conquest of the of Canaan. Uh, Job, again, is a biography of Job. And so as you think about this, a lot of our Old Testament is biography. And also not only about that person's life, but how God has dealt with that person in their life as well. And so with this uh, uh, idea of it being a biography and uh, God's dealing with people, that gets us to uh, God chose the Hebrew language then for two reasons, but it's because of this idea of it being a biography. And there's a couple of things you need whenever you're thinking of something that's more of a, in a story uh, type of setting. And number one, why God chose to use the Hebrew language for this biography uh, of sorts is because Hebrew is a pictorial language. It is a language that uh, brings pictures to the forefront. It's something that describes an event, describes a person's life, and it does so with such imagery that you can uh, basically picture it yourself. You can picture yourself being there. And if you think about uh, such simple examples as the Israelites uh, crossing the Red Sea. The images that the Bible produces about how you've got an army behind, you've got a cloud of, of a, a cloud and fire before you. You've got these millions of Israelites. You've got a sea uh, with Moses, and he hits his rod down. The walls of water come up. As the Israelites cross, the waters come crashing down and drown the army. You can picture that in your mind. And so Hebrew allows for that. It allows for those pictures to be so vivid in our imaginations. And so the Hebrew language uses vivid metaphors uh, that dramatize a story. They make that story come alive uh, for you. For example, if you look at the book of Amos and you look at the first two chapters, you've got a list there of these judgments on the nations. And as you look at some of the imagery that's used there, for example, in Amos 1 and verse number 3, he says, for three transgressions on Damascus and, not, and for four, I will turn away the punishment thereof because they have threshed Gilead with threshing instruments of iron. And so you've got this picture now of this threshing that's happening, of this uh, taking in of the wheat with those metal tools. And so that puts a picture in our minds. You look at chapter 2 and verse number 1. He says, because uh, he burned the bones of the king of Edom in the lime. And so you've got this picture of a burning so intense that it petrifies uh, those bones there. Uh, chapter 2, verse number 9. He says that I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the great cedars. He was strong as the oaks. Okay, and so you've got this imagery of these gigantic trees here for them. And then uh, verse number 13, Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. And so you've got the picture there of a cart that's full to the brim of these sheaves of wheat or something like that. And it's actually pressing that cart down into the soil. And so Hebrew does that. It produces images that help to solidify something into your mind. And so as we think about this, it, it makes these vivid metaphors. And what this does is it creates pictures of the events that are being narrated. And what that does is it actually helps them to be memorized. 
I mean, you think about how many children know the story of Joseph. Why do so many children know the story of Joseph? He had a coat of many colors. It's a picture in your mind. You think about uh, David with Saul. Why do so many know about David? Because you've got the picture of little David and a, and a giant before him with that sling and those stones. Okay, it creates that picture for you. We've got the image of David, and you've got Saul, who was head and shoulders above everyone else. Um, whenever he was chosen to be king. And so as we think about these things, these things create pictures of the events. And what that helps to do is it helps us to memorize, helps us to solidify those ideas in our minds. And you think about um, the Hebrews, you think about the Israelites, and how they pass a lot of these stories down. Of course, you had uh, the written record that was kept, but also... God kept telling the Israelites, you make sure you tell your children these stories. Okay, tell them these things that happened. He would have them set up uh, monuments, memorials, like whenever Joshua and the Israelites crossed the Jordan River to go into the promised land to begin to take that promised land. He told them to put up a pile of stones so that whenever the parents and their children would walk by, they would ask what those stones were for, and the parents would tell them the story of how the Israelites crossed the Jordan River on dry ground, how they besieged Jericho and Ai and other places uh, and continued into the conquest of that promised land. But they would pass on a lot of these things orally to their children. And so you needed something that helped children understand the stories. And so what would you use? A language that's full of pictures, of imagery, and things of that nature. And and because we have a written record of those things, whenever we read our Old Testaments, we get those same pictures in our minds uh, that were used. And so it was a pictorial language. But... As a pictorial language, what this does is it creates a vivid picture of the acts of God okay, among a people who then became an example for future generations. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, as uh, Paul explains <coughs> excuse me, this idea uh, of the Israelites and how they're exam- an example for us, look at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 11 there. Now all these things happen unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so Paul says those things that happened to Israel in the past, they're an example for you. Okay, You can learn from what happened to them. And so as we think about this uh, pictorial language, because of all those pictures that were made for us, we can then go back and look at those pictures, uh, imagine those things that happen, and those become examples uh, for us. Because Romans 15, 4, those things written aforetime are written for our learning. We learn from those things. But we've got this idea of being able to picture those events. As you start to get into the New Testament, yes, you have some picturing of things. For example, the birth of Christ, Christ on the cross, and things like that bring pictures to our minds. But a lot of the New Testament is uh, uh, more of a, of a thinking type of language. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. But, for example, you read Galatians, Ephesians, uh, of course, the other epistles as well. But those, those don't really bring pictures to your minds. They bring um, a thought process. They bring something that you have to think about and work on and analyze uh, mentally. But it's not really a picture like it is in the Old Testament. And so it was a pictorial language. So that's one reason why uh, Hebrew was used. But then number two, it was a personal language. Okay, remember, this is a biography. This is a story of a people and, their, and how God has dealt with them. And so you need a language that is personal uh, to those people. And, of course, Hebrew was the language which they used uh, 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 not only for writing but for speaking and things like that. But as we think about it being a personal language, the language of of Hebrew speaks to the heart and the emotions rather than the mind or reason. And so as we think about uh, the Old Testament, we think about the language that was used there. Whenever you read your Old Testament, there's not a lot um, that goes into 
the mind or having to reason through things. You're reading the story of someone, their biography, how God has dealt with that person, and what's that going to speak more towards? It's going to speak to your heart and your emotions. You don't really have to reason through uh, the story of Joseph. You read the account, you see what happened to him, it brings pictures to your minds, and it plays on your emotions. It doesn't really play with your mind and your reason too much. Are there things to think about in the Old Testament? Yes. But for the most part, it plays to your heart and your emotions. The Hebrew language appeals more to the realities of life rather than theoretical and philosophical ideas. You get to the New Testament, however, when, especially whenever Paul writes, he'll write in a, in a logic uh, type of standpoint, and you have to think and reason through those things. But you read the Old Testament, it applies to the reality of life. You read stories like Joseph's and the temptations that he dealt with, the family issues that he had. You read about Job and all the troubles that happened with him. You read about David, his temptations, his life, about Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes and talked about all the vanities of life and how uh, he tried all those different things but found no pleasure in them, that speaks to the reality of life. That doesn't really speak to the mind and to reasoning. It speaks to uh, uh, the, just life in general. And that's what the Hebrew language is good for. The Hebrew language is all about uh, pictures, about uh, these examples that we have, and playing on your heart and your emotion rather than on your mind or reason. So why did God choose Hebrew for the Old Testament? It's a biography of a people, and it is something... Uh, uh, about God's dealing with those people. And so you needed a language that brought that to life. You needed a language that brought the story into something that you could even use today in the modern world. And that's exactly what it did. You can read those different accounts, those different stories, and uh, find things that you can use and see in your own life and how people dealt with them. So it was a language that played on the emotions and the heart and about just the reality of life. But what that helped to do is prepare us for the New Testament. And the New Testament language is Greek. Okay? And so whenever you move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you're moving from Hebrew to Greek. And whenever we are going to look at Greek, you're going to see just how much of a difference there is between the New Testament and the Old Testament. But as we think about Greek, the New Testament was written in what's known as Koine Greek. And Koine simply just means common. It was the common Greek of the day. Okay, there, was, there were different dialects of Greek, but Koine was the one that pretty much everyone knew. It was a universal language. And so it was written in this Koine Greek. And the New Testament then, remember the Old Testament is the biography and God's dealing with people. The New Testament now is the interpretation and the revelation, the revealing of Christ. And so whenever we think about the purpose of the two different testaments, Old Testament about the biography and how we got to Christ, New Testament now is the interpretation of Christ, the revelation of who Christ is, you need a language that can do that. Okay, So the Old Testament was all about revealing those things and getting us ready to come to Christ. Now that he's here, we need something that will play with our mind and our reason. Why should I accept Christ? Why should I know that he is the Son of God? I need something that's logical, something that plays with my mind and my reason, not just my emotions. And so that's uh, why we're going to get into uh, the two different reasons for this. Because it's now this purpose, God chose the Greek language for two uh, main reasons. So we switch from Hebrew to Greek, and there's a big purpose for that. We've changed the purpose of the Testament. Old Testament had a purpose. New Testament has a purpose. And so as we think about this, number one, uh, Greek is an intellectual language. Remember, Hebrew was a language of pictures and emotion. Greek, however, is an intellectual language. Whereas Hebrew was more a language of the heart, Greek is a language of the mind. It's one that you have to think on those things which are written and understand those things. It's not just you read a story and you already know what that story is about. It's something you read this, now you have to understand it in your mind uh, what it means. It's, it's an intellectual language. All right? This was a language that could take a revelation from God. So you've got God speaking to man. 
And it could take that and put it into a simple, uh, communicable form. Okay, something that you could communicate. Because you think about, you've got communication from God to man. Okay, you've got Christ, you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got the apostles. But you have to have some way to have that simply given to everyone. And that's what Greek allows. It allows these revelations from God, something you would think would be so complex, and yet it takes it and puts it into something simple that everyone can understand. But it's still something that you have to reason with, something that plays on your mind. But it's this language that is intellectual that allows for this communication. Not only that, Greek is much more useful in expressing the logical truth of the New Testament. For example, you read the book of Galatians. Whenever Paul wrote to the Galatians, he wrote it in a style that is based on logic. He offers arguments and then offers counter-arguments. Okay, it's written in a logical kind of state. You don't read the book of Galatians and you've got this story picture in your mind like you would with the Old Testament. Instead, you read Galatians and you have to work through the logic that Paul puts out. Okay, it's an intellectual language. It's something which plays with your mind rather than your emotions. So this allows for us now that we've got Christ and you've got uh, his gospel. He provides a logical reason why you should obey that gospel. Okay, not just playing on your emotions, but playing on your reason. I'm reminded of Isaiah, come and let us reason together. Okay, God wants you to think through things and to understand things, not just believe whatever you hear or to believe a good story. Okay, but Greek possesses a lot more precision than Hebrew. Okay, so you read through uh, your Old Testament, the Hebrew language, it's not nearly as precise as the Greek language is. But the Greek language has uh, a lot more precision. And what that did is it allowed theological truths that were kind of generally expressed in the Old Testament to be specifically stated in the New Testament. Okay, and so, for example, you read the book of Romans, you read the book of Hebrews. Okay, you remember, especially with the book of Hebrews, Old Testament you had, what, animal sacrifices, right? That was just a general revelation. Why in the world would we have to do all these animal sacrifices? Well, God commanded it. That's why they did it. But what was it leading to? It was leading to Christ. And the book of Hebrews takes that general practice of animal sacrifice and now precisely gives the reason why it was happening. Because Christ was coming. And you had to understand that you needed a, a uh, sinless, a, a, a perfect sacrifice for sin. That blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews 10.4, could not take away sin. And so Hebrews expresses precisely what all that general uh, stuff from the Old Testament was about. And so it allows for that precision uh, that we have. And so whenever we think about Hebrew versus Greek, Old Testament, you had those pictures and things of that bio, uh, biographical nature. You get to the New Testament, you need something that's logical, something that's precise. Why should I believe that Jesus is the Christ? Well, here goes Paul. Here's why you need to believe that and, pro and provide you uh, reasons and, and arguments why you should do that. And so Greek is all about this uh, logic uh, standing. But then number two, not only did we need something that uh, appealed to the mind rather than just the emotions, you also needed a universal language. And that's exactly what Greek was. The message of the gospel was to be spread to all nations. Okay, You know, you have the Great Commission, and really you have the Great Commission in all four gospels, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15, Luke 24, 47. John's is a little bit uh, more unclear about its uh, Great Commission standpoint, but it's still there, John 20, 21 through 23. Uh, those are all the Great Commission. And then in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, Jesus told his apostles that you need to wait in Jerusalem until you're endowed with power from on high, from the Holy Spirit, and then you need to take that message uh, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so as we think about how we need something to be taken to the entire world, okay, to all nations, what then would be the best course of action? Would you keep Hebrew? 
Okay, a language that was just for the Israelites, something that you would have to have a scholar be able to translate for you, or would you use a universal language, something that could be taken to everyone and everyone already knows the language? Well, obviously it would be the second choice. Okay, so one reason, again, why God chose Greek is it, it appealed to logic. And then number two is that it was universal. Everyone in the civilized world had this form of Greek. That's why it was called common Greek. Okay, you would learn your national language, but you would also learn this Koine Greek because that's what a lot of different uh, things were are dealt with. And you could go to different parts of the world, and you might not speak their, their national language, but you could talk to that person in Greek, and they would be able to understand what you were talking about. And so God then chose uh, Greek because it could be taken to all nations. And then also, he would choose the language that was most widely used throughout the world. And of course, that would be the Koine Greek. And so why did God choose uh, Greek instead of Hebrew for your New Testament? It's because now, instead of a biography, now you've got something uh, uh, of interpretation, interpreting who Christ is, uh, why he came, and what I need to do about it. You can't do that with the Hebrew language. You can do it with Greek, which gives you precise terms, which allows for logical arguments and things of that nature. And then also because it was so widely used, it was the best choice to spread a universal gospel. Okay, the gospel is for all. We sing the song about that. And so how do you get the gospel to all? You use the language that everyone speaks. And then, of course, uh, Colossians 1, I believe in about verse number 20, that the gospel, Paul says, was taken to the whole world. And so we know that God's plan then obviously worked because he chose that universal language. And so as we think about uh, Aramaic, Latin, Hebrew, Greek, uh, some are not used very much, others are used a lot. But did God have a purpose for each language that he chose? Absolutely. Okay, so God had a plan. He had a reason why he chose those different languages to be used. It wasn't just haphazard. It wasn't just because uh, that's the one that might work. It's because God had a plan. He had a purpose and knew uh, what he needed to do with each of those. And so that finishes the languages part of our study. And what we're going to do uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks is I'm going to talk about the Apocrypha, uh, the pseudepigrapha, and I'll, I'll talk to you about what those terms mean uh, later on. Uh, but we're going to look at some of those books that are either disputed, because there are several books. That's what we're going to look at first, uh, starting next week, is there are some books of our Bible that people dispute whether they should be there or not. For example, Song of Solomon, um, Ecclesiastes, uh, some of the New Testament books um, with some of John's writings. Uh, some have claimed that James wasn't inspired. And so we're going to look at some of those ones that are in our Bibles but people have a problem with and show why they do belong in our Bibles. And then we're going to take a look um, after that about books that don't belong in our Bibles. Okay, we're going to look at the Apocrypha, like the Maccabees, uh, the continuations of Esther, um, and things like that, and why those do not belong in our Bibles. Because there are a lot of false teachings that come from those books because some people say that they belong in our Bibles, when indeed they obviously do not once we begin to look at them. Uh, but we'll do that. And once we finish the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, that'll finish section two of our study. And then we'll jump into uh, the last section, which was uh, about textual criticism. Uh, that sounds scary and complicated, uh, but I'm going to get it as simple as we can. But all textual criticism is about is how do we know that the manuscripts, okay, the uh, documents that we have that have scripture on them, how can we trust them? How can we trust uh, for example, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, how can we trust uh, these different uh, things that have been found that have scripture on them to know that our Bibles today are accurate and that they're what the original actually was. And then we'll also look at some modern day translations as well, uh, which uh, translations are accurate, which ones are not, um, and things of that nature as well. Uh, but so thankful for uh, everyone tuning in. I hope this study has been good for you. Um, I talked to the elders the other day, and I, I believe I'm going to be finished maybe July, August uh, with this study. I know it's been a little bit lengthy, but hopefully it's been good for you, uh, that you've enjoyed it, and it's helped to strengthen your faith. But 
uh, pray for your continued health and safety, and can't wait till the next time that we get to be together. I'd like to thank all of you for being that online with us tonight. Uh, Cottondale family, we miss you. Uh, hope and pray one day we'll be able to meet together, but until then, uh, this is great to be able to do this, and you know that we're just a phone call away, like we mentioned uh, in our Sunday uh, viewing. If you need any anything, don't hesitate to, to call us. We're a phone call away, and we'll do what we can. We, we're a family, and families take care of family so be sure to, to do that Jason thank you so much for that I it, it never fails that I learned something from every one of your uh, lessons and it's a faith building lesson anytime that we know that things didn't just happen haphazardly God had a plan and we know that and that builds faith on us let's study like we said and we can take this lesson and view it again if we need to and be able to, to add uh, knowledge uh, about our Bible and looking forward to the, the rest of it our, uh, of our Wednesday night Bible class. A couple of announcements that, that we need to mention. Uh, one thing I also failed to mention Sunday was our Utah work down there, mission work, Brother Stephen Nelson. He has an online, he's on Facebook. He'll do his uh, live on Sunday morning. I think his is at 11. Uh, and uh, also Friday, his Bible study night. So view him. Uh, good lessons on that. Brother Stephen Nelson, our Utah work. And let's encourage him and, and, and let him know that you're, you're viewing his lessons. So also, uh, Ruth is back home and we encourage you to call her. And also, Wade is, is available. We'll get you his address uh, soon. And you can write him, or his phone number is, is like it is in the book, uh, the, the book. So give him a call and encourage him. And our Africa brothers and sisters, the pandemic is there also. We encourage you to pray for them because they don't have the medical uh, things that we have here to help us get through this dreaded disease. Uh, if you have a need, Cottondale, please remember... Uh, to call us and help and let us know if there's a need spiritually we can deal with that and if there's anyone that would like to obey the gospel or to study we can do that in a safe way also I'll assure you so be sure to let us know and uh, Christian Cottondale be sure to, to do what you can we'd mentioned Sunday in our worship service to, this is an excellent time to grow and to encourage and and do what you can to write cards and, and letters also. So with that, Cottondale, we love you. And we pray and hope and pray that you stay safe, obey the, the, the laws that we have ongoing right now. And if there's any changes, we'll let you know in the way that we're, we're bringing you our worship service and our Bible study on Wednesday night as soon as we get some different uh, information. With that, if you would, bow with me, and we'll close out with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful for this time that we can study your word and, and grow and mature. We are, we're grateful for Jason and his knowledge that, that he has to be able to, to, te to, to open your word and, uh, and convey it to us and, and so we can have that, that knowledge so where we can grow and and convey it to others. We thank you for him and the, the time that he was able to study and, and go, go to, to Memphis School to, to learn these things. Be with him and his family. We pray for them. Keep them safe. Pray for others that are uh, of the Cottondale family that are dealing with uh, uh, some health problems. Be with our shut-ins and and. Uh, be with the ones that are dealing with health problems. Help them to stay safe and, and be able to avoid this uh, terrible virus. And we pray that you'll be with us. Help us to do everything that we can do to spread the gospel, to encourage others, to help others when we see a need, and to grow and mature in the faith. 
thank you for your love for us. Father, we, we pray for our government. Help them to make good decisions that we can work out of this as quick as we can and in a good, safe way and get back to where we can gather together and, and as a family and encourage others. It's in your blessed Son's name I pray. Amen.